I study the future for a living. I cannot predict it. And if you come across anybody who claims they can, I would probably just advise you to calmly look for the nearest exit. <laughs> but what I can do is examine a bunch of data and build forecasts about where the future may be headed. This is Shudu Graham. She's a striking South African model, likely on the path to a supermodel. Scroll through her Instagram. You can see all of the big campaigns she's landed. She's been featured in Vogue a few times, which is kind of like the Holy Grail. And she's also an activist. She uses her platform as a rising black supermodel to call for more diversity in fashion. And I think that's incredibly admirable. There's another fact about Shudu. She isn't real. She's a digital construction, an avatar, or what we call in the tech world, computer-generated imagery. This revelation, big or small, depending on your pre-existing trust issues with the internet, hasn't hurt Shudu's career one bit. In fact, she's been thriving. She was even dubbed the world's first digital supermodel. As a futurist, I wasn't entirely shocked to see an avatar as a fashion model because most jobs will be impacted by technology, including fashion modeling. And this is a very real challenge we all need to be preparing for. But I want to share with you another consequence I find concerning. Shudu is black and identifies as female. The person who created and who controls her is white and male. The future is heading in a direction where people can create and control identities outside of their own ethnic groups. This creates ample opportunity for exploitation of already marginalized communities. And if we aren't careful, this could become a massive societal problem. Avatars are stepping into industries from every angle. Microsoft alone plans to introduce avatars to the 250 million people around the world who use Microsoft Teams. There are avatars on social media with over 3 million followers. And this is an image of Samsung's AI-powered avatars called Neons, which are being designed for roles such as news anchor, spokesperson, and movie actor. Picture the dynamic with Shudu, but across all of these industries. Right off the bat, I see two glaring opportunities for exploitation, through profit and through misrepresentation. People can create and profit off of the ethnicity an avatar represents without being a part of that ethnic group. And this is very significant. Avatars are replacing real people in a lot of scenarios. Shudu represents a real black fashion model, but the income her identity generates isn't going to black women, it's going to a white man. This financially shuts out black women while their image is still being profited off of. And there's a lot of money to be made here. The average fashion model makes between 41,000 and 300,000 a year. The ability to create avatars redirects all of this income just not necessarily into the hands of the people the avatar represents. And it's important to point out that access to the market that creates avatars like Shudu, it isn't equal. Creating this type of an avatar requires access to financial resources, the computers, the programs. It requires access to very specific tech skills and the time and environment to build those skills. There are structural challenges that make it harder for some communities to access these resources over others. And therefore, some groups, more specifically marginalized communities, may be much less likely to be the ones who get to create the avatars and much more likely to be the ones who get profited off of. And in this example, we see this dynamic playing out at the expense of black women. The second area for exploitation to occur is in the pursuit of profit. The group the avatar represents may be drastically misrepresented. They may be stereotyped, appropriated, manipulated. In this example, a black woman is being represented 
through the eyes of a white man. The features, skin tone, hairstyles, he finds desirable. There is ample opportunity for misrepresentation and stereotyping here, which marginalizes real black women. Shudu could also be used to model for a brand a black woman may never have agreed to work with. And when you zoom out a bit, you can see this scenario playing out as a loophole for companies. Instead of having to invest in diversity or improve company culture around inclusion, a company could just create avatars from different ethnic groups instead and manipulate the relationship those groups may have with that company. And finally, when a dominant culture takes elements from a less dominant group and derives commercial benefit from it, it's usually called cultural appropriation. In a world with avatars, this becomes incredibly complicated. Everything from the items and the clothing the avatar may be styled in to the entire identity of the avatar itself. Take this image of Shudu, posted to her Instagram wearing the sacred neck rings associated with the Indabelli people of South Africa, and a black power emoji as the caption. The person deriving commercial benefit from this image is a white man. I call this robot cultural appropriation. And what makes it incredibly complicated and deceptive is that you can't really spot it unless you know the identity of the creator behind the avatar. I'm focusing on the example of exploitation through the context of modeling, but picture the avatar as a physician, a teacher, a social worker. The same questions still emerge. Avatars are going to play an important role in our society. We need to ensure that the rooms where they're being created are accessible and reflective of the diverse society we live in, or else this dynamic will just continue. There are other technologies where these exploitative dynamics are creeping in, such as virtual reality, a technology many of us will soon be engaging with if you haven't already. And just in case you aren't familiar with virtual reality, it currently involves putting on a headset and stepping into a live virtual world as an avatar or as a digital character. And I emphasize the word currently because the technology we use to access these virtual worlds will continue to evolve. PwC forecasts that by 2030, over 23 million jobs will involve extended reality technologies like VR. And for the record, that was very much a forecast, not a prediction. <laughs> Firefighting departments are using it to simulate real life scenarios. Medical schools are using it to train future doctors on how to perform surgery. A company that sells virtual reality simulations recently made headlines for hiring actors to play roles from ethnic groups they don't belong to. For example, white actors were acting as black and Asian characters in the simulation. And the scenes they were acting out were very sensitive to these ethnic groups, such as a traumatized employee after an incident of racial injustice. If these scenes weren't taking place in virtual reality, instead it was a live play on stage, would white actors still be playing black and Asian characters? So the question becomes, do we care about the identities people take on in virtual reality? If that person is supposed to be speaking about or representing a specific ethnic group, like in this example, and profiting off of that identity, I believe we should care because the same opportunities for exploitation exist, profit and misrepresentation. Unlike the previous example, where technology was replacing the job of a human, in virtual reality, the job might not be going away. Actors were still being cast to play black and Asian characters. It's just the jobs didn't go to people from either of those communities, and neither did the profits. The same way we probably wouldn't cast a white actor to play a South Asian character in a movie or represent a South Asian voice in a cartoon. We need to start considering how these dynamics should play out in newer forms of media. 
And when it comes to misrepresentation, there's something very troubling about a marginalized group not being able to speak about their own marginalized experiences. Even if it's in virtual reality, while another group benefits from it, there is ample opportunity for stereotyping and cultural insensitivity when people don't get to tell their own stories. Some of the world's biggest tech companies are betting on virtual reality as the workplace of the future. This is an image from Meta, formerly known as Facebook, their vision for the future of work. It is still largely up for debate whether or not this vision will come true. But imagine the possibilities if it does. And we don't get this right. Companies asking employees to use indigenous and Latino avatars in client meetings because they know it will look good to show more diversity on the team. A DJ who changes the ethnicity of her avatar depending on which music event she's marketing herself to. For this talk, I focused on exploitation through the lens of race, but similar questions are raised in the context of disability, gender, and sexual orientation. People leveraging these technologies to exploit people from these communities. Our future with technology presents these opportunities and it causes me a lot of concern. And I hope it causes you concern too. But these scenarios, they don't have to be the future we end up in. We have a choice in the way we create technology and in the way we use it. We need to always consider how the technologies we build intersect with socio-demographic factors such as race, gender, and sexual orientation. We need to pay close attention to who's in the room when we're coding the future, making sure these rooms are diverse and reflective of the society we want to live in and ensuring everyone has equal access to these rooms needs to be a top priority. And we also have a role to play as individuals in shaping the ethical standards and etiquette we want to see in technology. It shouldn't just be up to a few people or a few companies. These technologies impact all of our lives, but it requires us to lean in to technology, to learn about it, to engage with it, so we can steer it, and we can shape it. Technology will allow us to present our humanity to the world in new ways, and in some ways it may be amazing that we can play parts that aren't us. There may be specific context where this is a good thing, but it doesn't mean we should wholeheartedly accept people playing different roles without questioning the ethics behind it. Who the puppeteer is matters. The person pulling the strings matters, and I ask that you think deeply about that. The next time you're greeted by an avatar, ask yourself, who is this person? Who is the person behind the curtain? Thank you.